I, you know, sometimes I guess <clears throat> people don't connect the dots with what you're saying. Sometimes they don't, I guess, understand what you mean. And so maybe for some of you, you get tired of hearing this, but it's in my devotional today. And I thought maybe you should bring it up again, you know, and maybe try to make it a little more obvious. When we, when we talk about God, we're not talking about an idea. We're talking about a person. When we talk about Jesus, we're not talking about a religious concept. We're talking about a person. When we talk about His Spirit, we're not talking about some mystical feeling idea, you know, this kind of touchy-feely thing. But we're talking about a person. We're talking about reality. I don't know how you're going to put this into place in your life, because I only know how God has forced Himself into my life. And that's what you want if you are going to follow Him, is you want God to force Himself into your life, to reveal Himself in all of your life, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. I myself am nobody special. I'm not perfect. God forbid, you know, that anybody ever get the idea that I'm some kind of, you know, spiritual genius or I have some unique qualities and abilities far beyond the measure of any man, you know, that God would look down and say, ha, he's perfectly fit for what I want to use, or that I was some kind of like outrageous, unbelievable sinner, you know, before I got saved. No, I, as a matter of fact, I'm kind of like, you know, your average everyday Joe Blow, nobody didn't know anything, didn't do anything kind of person. I was shy, as a matter of fact, I was kind of timid, you know, and I wasn't a David, you know, that was out there, you know, slaying lions, you know. I got my butt kicked a lot. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was nobody. And a lot of people out there that you think are somebody really were nobodies. And the more of a nobody that you really are, the more that God could use you. And if you really are somebody or nobody or anybody, if you really go after God, He will reveal Himself to you. I'm not exaggerating. There is no doubt every day of my life, God speaks to me in some way. Sometimes He speaks to me out of it. That's, that's real cool. You know, I mean, personally, <laughs> it's a little easier when He talks audibly, you know. It's kind of like, oh, okay, fine, you know. But in reality, when He speaks audibly, I kind of don't like it as much as when He kind of speaks through devotionals because audibly you don't make any mistake or you don't have no leeway because you kind of know what he's saying <laughs> but what I, the point I'm trying to make is that Jesus is real you need to make that real in your life you need to appropriate or apply it to yourself you need to find out somehow to prove a starting point let's call it that okay between you and I you know if you're an intellectual great Intellectually, put this as a starting point and use your kismet meter, you know, like this is all, you know, random quantum physics put together into, you know, quantifying the experiential uh, experimentation of an exi existential reality that's beyond our comprehension that can operate within the, the parameters of the physical realm that we can demonstrate through a provable means that the operational procedures with which this existential being that exists outside of our dimensional reality can intervene in the parameters or the specifications within the, the module that we create for him to demonstrate whether or not he is real or not, if you're an intellectual. And that would be, hey, put it down on paper, you know, write down something, you know, and see if God will fulfill it. If he does, then see what the probability factors are, if there's any way that anything else could have probably, or you could have causatory, created some kind of effect for you to make it to come true. Because God is seeking to save you from yourself, really. And that's probably the biggest problem there is with people today. They don't realize God is real. They don't live like it. I mean, I was talking on the internet to somebody and they kept telling me, Oh, you don't understand. There's there's so much gang warfare and there's so much evil and so much stuff going on. You need to do something. I say, I do. I talk to people. I share Jesus. I pray for them. I pray for their salvation. I pray for their protection. I pray for this. I pray for that. I pray for all kinds of things. And I talk to God and God tells me what to do. I say, no, you don't get it. You know, you got to do something. I said, I do something. 
He said, I know that Jesus is real and God will intervene and he will take care of it. I would witness to a drug cartel, a gang cartel, whatever, if God sends me there. And the point being is that God has in the past. Hey, you know, I grew up with Black Panthers, you know, and Watts in L.A. and all kinds of gang warfares going on around me. And I'm not dead. God kept me. So at some point in time, you kind of got to put God into the testing place of seeing if he really is able to protect you, if he really is able to provide for you, if he really is wanting to spend time with you. Because that's the point. Your first starting point is proving that God exists and that he's trying to communicate to you that you're the one with the fingers in your ears, hands over your eyes, and you got your mouth covered. Because it's not his fault. He's been talking to the rest of us for a long time. He's been speaking pretty clearly, and he's been communicating pretty obviously to some of us. So if you don't see it, I think there's an issue that you might want to deal with. And I could tell you what it is, but you wouldn't believe me. So deal with it and prove it to yourself. Because God, once you discover he's real, man, your whole universe opens up. As a matter of fact, your whole way of doing everything ought to change. You ought to begin to see how much of God can, or if you're ready to receive this, I don't know if you're ready or not. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't want to know that God does so much. But if you're really ready to receive this, maybe you'll find out that God really does intervene always in everything. Even the tornadoes and the people, the disasters? Yes. You think it just happens by circumstance? Oh, come on. There's plans in it. God protects some and some die and some are taken care of and some have already had the provision, the opportunity to you know, ask you in their life. Whatever. Sure, the world goes on, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't allow, God didn't allow it to happen or God hasn't used it for his purposes because he already knows what's going to happen and he does use it for his purposes. So don't think that he sent it, per se. He used it in his way. That's the difference. He knows what will happen. He's always known what will happen. He's just got a mindset that's so intricate and detailed, if he knows every hair on your head, which the Bible says, then of course he can use every single circumstance that's in life, whether it be the wind blowing at this moment, which I just felt the wind blow by and it was cold, you know, okay, and it gave me a little chill and a goosebump, which wasn't the Holy Spirit. <laughs> or, you know, God causes the sun to shine, the rain to fall on the wicked and the good. He is the one who does it. Look at Job if you don't understand it and read it, if you want to try to prove it. But in the circumstantial of life, once you start with proving God exists, then you need to go to the place where God reveals himself to you. Go beyond what you think is just, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm a Christian, but, you know, that God stuff, you know, I, I let the preacher tell me. You know, he, he teaches me, you know, I, I read my Bible, you know, I do my thing, you know, I'm good, you know. I do the best I can, you know, I pray I'm blessed and I let the doors open if they will and close if they won't, you know. No, because God desires you. God loves you. God wants you to come farther in or, as we could say, closer to him. Because that's where you're going when you die. You're going to know him in a personal and intimate way. He wants you to walk with him today. He wants you to talk with him today. He wants you to be cognizant of him and aware of him as he's walking with you. Last night I took my wife for a walk. You know, and we were kind of bummed, you know, kind of burned out, you know. We had been praying about moving for a long time and finally the opportunities came open so we step forward as God said to and we took a step of faith and he closed one door and we asked him to we said God you know man you know you told us to move so now we're opening the door to go through it and so we've looked at this first place you know and we did our research we did our homework we did everything about it and it all looked good it worked out on paper it seemed good you know said okay well you know now let's pray God we're going to go out and take this step of faith we've we know you're telling us to move. We're going to kind of look at this place and see. And so the first place we went to? No. <laughs> and my wife was kind of bummed, you know. And I went, hey, give thanks. 
you asked before you prayed that God would either open the door or close it. Thank God he made it so obvious that he closed the door. So we gave thanks. And then the next day, there was another one that came up. And so we took the moment to pray and to do the one thing that God said to do. Pray, commit it to him, to move forward, to see if it was a good thing, to try to get into it, see and take our step. So we did. We even went pretty far, much farther than the last one. And we went through this interview thing. And then it turned out we were overqualified. We couldn't get in. We didn't know it was like a housing project kind of thingy. And I was like, I don't think it said that on the website, but that's okay. So there again, God closed the door. Then the next day, and I said, Lord, you know, we need to find a place by the end of the third day. Because it was like a three-day weekend, you know, that we just went through. And we need a place. So we went to a place and we talked about it, prayed about it, went for it, you know. And I was hoping that my wife would fall in love with it. And so I let her go. And she did. And she filled out the paperwork. And now we were all excited because we looks like we got it. And then, you know, kind of like they have to have one more approval. And I went, well, you know, if they do, praise the Lord. If they don't, praise the Lord. So we went on a walk at night. And both of us really wanted to have the news by last night, you know. And we didn't. So she was bummed. And I was walking along. And I told her, I said, you know, God, this is the cool of the day. And we want you to walk with us. We want you to comfort us. We want you to be with us. We don't want to be like other people that pretend there's a God and just talk into the air and you know, don't know if their prayers went anywhere. But rather, Father, I desire that you would be like you said you would be as Enoch, that you said you would be to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to anyone who would call upon your name, that Jesus prayed for us and gave us a promise that if he would live inside us by his spirit, that we could come to you and just be real with you. And so, Father, I'm, I'm wanting to talk with you now as you walk with us and to just give it over to you and let you, you know, be with us as we take our evening walk. And, you know, I felt a peace because, first of all, my stars in the sky. It's a long story on that one. Me and the Lord got a private thing going, so I can go tell you about it. But anyways, <laughs> that was there. And uh, my wife knows about it. So anyways, you know, it was fun sharing. And then we kept walking and, you know, we felt better. Came back home and, you know, spent the evening and, you know, took our time. And praise the Lord. Today we find out. So the joy that God wants to give to you is the same one that I experienced as I walked it, spoke out my heart to him. I can turn over my life to him. I can turn over my concerns to him. I can share with him as the best friend and closest confidant everything that's going on in my life, even my sins that are sometimes disgusting. <laughs> you know, and just say, but God, you said you were gonna, you know, like clean me up and help me out and you know take care of this. You know, I don't see it. You know, you know, we need to get this next one down. You know, kind of let's wipe this one out. And so, as I was thinking of that this morning, God spoke to me about how many people still don't really try to even hear him speak, much less to know him in a personal way. And I, I guess what's sad about that is that you're going to get burned out. You're going to get blown out by the world. The stuff that's going to come at you in 2012, politically, economically, socially, religiously, um, emotionally, is going to overwhelm you because it is meant to. We're living in a generation that can't deal with the bombardment of information you get way too much of through texting, through visual stimulation, through television, through internet, through iPads and iPods and all this input devices that are all inputting to you without you exporting all the garbage that's in there. You gotta have an export somewhere and God wants to be in the import and export business for you to take away the taxes that are killing you, that are taxing your soul and causing your spirit to drown in all this worldliness when God wants to turn it over to godliness. 
He wanted your spirit to be set free, to be just exalted out beyond the physical limitations of your body, to just fly to Him with your joy, with your excitement, with your love. Because He loves you. And He's precious to you in tenderness. Because He's given you His Son. And that is the most tender emotional bond you'll ever imagine with the Father and the Son have. You and I, we need to pursue God and go after Him to grasp a hold of that tenderness, that gentleness that God the Father really is. And when you know that, when you've experienced that, then it's like, wow, you don't want anything to interrupt that. God's rush to give. Silence, be silent before me, and seek to know, and then do my will in all things. Abide in my love, an atmosphere of loving, understanding to all men. This is your part to carry out, and then I surround you with a protective screen that keeps all evil from you. It is fashioned by your own attitude of mind, words, and deeds towards others. You know, I'll be honest, I have a problem at times with my attitude. I, I deal with people on the internet and they don't want to talk about God. They want to talk about, you know, some evil thing or some person's done something or this, that, or the other thing. And God's already given me His, given me His Holy Spirit, so I always see through what they're saying, you know, and I know where they're coming from. They're bitter, or, you know. They don't think they're being bitter, but they're bitter, you know. And they vaunt or vent, you know, their words on the internet and it spews out like some cesspool of information, you know, it just infects everyone, stinks to high heaven, and you just want to say something about it, you know, and then the person gets offended and you got to keep working with them back and forth and sharing and, you know, kind of caring and, you know, getting them to a place where they realize, hey, you know, the guy wasn't so bad after all. Maybe he does have a problem. You know, and sadly, that affects me, and I've had God tell me, you need to step back, you know, from what you're doing in ministry at times, to walk away from it, to refresh yourself with me, so that your next person that you're caring for doesn't get anything left over from the person before. And I have an issue with that. I struggle with that, you know, and, and some people, you know, incorrectly chastise me for it, you know because they don't know my attitude or my heart, but they sometimes have a point, you know, and I listen to them and I, I examine my words which don't communicate, but then I see that maybe my attitude behind the words maybe have been off. So God wants to bring to us tenderness. It's a foreign word in the world right now because everyone's becoming violent, bitter, mad, angry, you know, stand up for your rights, assert yourself, you know, positive thinking and all this stuff. But not too many want to be tender, self-denial, uh, become a doormat for the people, to be caring, to be sharing, to be that type of person that could be relied on when you have a need. And you could go to them and ask and they would automatically help you. That they wouldn't even ask for anything in return, nor would you expect that. So few today do we see really desire to develop that virtue and that's what God wants us to become like because he's taking care of our needs we likewise can share that love that he's given us with so many others if you just open up your heart and yes you will get hurt at times but God is the one who can use that hurt to touch another soul to touch another life and to cause those whom you may not know to find him as well as for you to discover how much Jesus has changed you into himself that you'll be amazed at the type of tenderness that you have the type of peace you have in the midst of seemingly impossible situations God is always at work in you he's always for you but he's going to bring you through things in order to teach you things. I want to give you all things, good measure pressed down and running over. So be quick to learn. You know little yet of the divine impatience which longs to rush to give. 
Does one worrying thought enter your mind? One impatient thought? Then fight it at once. Don't let it take hold in your soul. Love and trust are the solvents for the worrying cares and frets of life. Apply them at once. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He will direct your path. Love and trust because you are channels and through that channel I long to bless others but don't let that channel become blocked with fret and impatience and worry nor let those things that are in your mind corrode them and in time would become beyond your help to eliminate from your life but rather turn them over to me and allow me to live in you and you live with me and walk with me in the times we choose to meet together for I love you and I've given my life for you and Jesus would so much so desire to be in you that people would see you and say either one of two things well three yes he's been with the Lord ooh that must have been the Lord because he's so much like Jesus or that's a Christian? <laughs> God forbid the last one become you and I. But can't we now choose to maybe at some point in time in our life prove God exists, prove God wants to spend time with us, and then prove God wants to bring us closer to himself and then demonstrate that to others by caring for them in the same tender way that we'll experience once we get closer to God? Because to get closer to man you have to get closer to God.